Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to this different session from what we are used to. This is a Ask Me Anything session with uh, Susanna Lopes. Susanna, thank you for being here. Thank you for accepting this challenge of being with us today. So this uh, session is promoted by Scala Porto, the strategy from the municipality of Porto to foster entrepreneurship in the city, together with an important community in, in the city, that's Product Management Nights Porto. And they've been with us curating content on product management. Thank you so much for doing this uh, with us as well. So this session is different from the previous masterclasses we have been organizing and we are skipping directly to the Q&A. So you had the chance of watching Susanna's talks before. We, we, have shared the, uh, we have shared these talks. We have shared also content that she produces. Right now is the time to go directly to Q&A and to roast her a little bit. And she's open to <laughs> answer all the questions on her failures and successes. Uh, as a product manager. Um, so uh, you are muted, but you are very welcome to leave your questions on the chat. You have also left our, your questions before uh, when you registered, and that's with those questions that we are starting. And I'm leaving already, and I'm passing this to Carlos. Carlos, please, this, the floor is yours. And well, Speak soon. Let's go. Okay. So yeah, I will start just just to, to brief you about product uh, product management night. So basically, uh, as you probably know already know, uh, we we are a community and we try to grow this product mindset by bringing uh, expertise uh, from people from our community, from our ecosystem, but also from outside like Susanna. Uh, and we try to bring them to the stage to share their knowledge and experiences. In our events, especially the, the physical ones, we also try to promote as much as possible networking in order to, um, yeah, to, to share experiences, to share knowledge and to try to grow and get more relevance uh, or product people get more relevance in our business and also tech ecosystem. So this is a, 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 this is a, a brief overview about what is Product Management Nights. We try to do uh, one event per quarter, uh, plus the ones that we are doing with Scalar Porto. Uh, we, and we, in November, uh, we, we probably are going to do an event uh, that is almost ready to be communicated, that is going to be around uh, product management uh, on AI, uh, products and RTP, uh, and also machine learning products. So we are going to have two speakers that will talk about that specific topic. So uh, I will end over now to Susanna just to give you a brief uh, overview about her. Hello. Um, I think we're doing this in English, so a lot of Susanna. Um, yeah, I've been a product manager for about uh, seven years or so. I'm one of the few seven to 11% of us that actually got into product management straight out of university. Uh, so I've never done anything else. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I'm a director of product uh, at a company called Onfido. Um, we verify identities online and we have an office in Lisbon, uh, San Francisco, New York, uh, London, where I'm based in uh, India, Singapore, a little bit all over the world. Um, we're about 400 and something people now. Um, and I look after our biometrics line of business. Um, so today I am here to be grilled <laughs> and to answer any questions uh, you guys want to ask about product management in general. Uh, I can also talk about um, some stuff at, at Aronfido, like our processes. Uh, and if you're feeling um, a little bit frisky, we could, we could go into biometrics and other like identity questions, uh, which I spend a lot of my time thinking about. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I, I'm uh, really excited to see like uh, more Portuguese product managers because <laughs> uh, there is a community, but they're not um, very visible in, in, in London where I'm based. So it, it's really exciting to connect with uh, fellow Portuguese um, nerds, if I may call our group uh, like that. So yeah, hit me up, Carlos. <laughs> So I tried to cluster uh, some of the many questions and great questions that we have, uh, and I will uh, start by the role. So you mentioned that we are you have your only expertise is uh, product. So I will start by that. So what is the greatest competence of a product manager? Mm. 
So the greatest competence, I, I think, will depend where you are at your career, right? So right at the beginning, um, you need to have like those raw ingredients of uh, are you empathetic with customers? Like, can you get to the bottom of why uh, people are suffering <laughs> with whatever problem they have? Um, then ideally, you have some way of speaking um, an engineering type language. I don't mean that you need to code, but that you need to be able to engage with your engineers in a way that you both speak the same language. Um, and you need to have some sort of business savviness to understand like what is viable and all that kind of stuff. So those are really critical right at the beginning and they kind of transcend your whole career. But the more and more senior you are, you go from tactical execution to then being more about operations and then suddenly being much more about strategy. Um, you need to be doing a little bit of all of those things since the beginning, but the distribution kind of changes over time. So when you think, when you ask me personally, like, what is the biggest quality about a product manager? I'm thinking about who I want to become. Like <laughs> when I grow up, <laughs> what do I want to be like? Um, and the area that I'm really focused on right now is like, how do I develop a more strategic mindset and how do I become like a visionary, right? I think when you start, you're just like, oh my God, what the hell are we building for the next one week? And then you're kind of like, you, you get more familiar with the space and you're like, okay, we know what we're doing for the next quarter. And then you get more senior and it starts to be a year. And then suddenly it's three years. Suddenly you're like living in the future in the 10 year horizon. So like, that's what I'm aiming for. Like, I think that would be an awesome characteristic to develop for, for my career at the moment. But I yeah. think those fundamentals never really change. Like you need to be deeply empathetic and care deeply about your your customers and, and spend time with them be able to speak their language i think maybe I, i'll summarize with like being a polyglot like being able to speak uh to all the different uh personas in your life as a pm yeah i, I believe that it doesn't matter what stage you are uh, empathy is always uh the one of the most important competence so i will jump to the next question that i think somehow maps what you what you answered now uh, there was a question about what uh, what the product manager should invest more. So should you invest more in the contact with the market or requirements or more on the delivery phase? Mm -hmm. So um, to me, there's a really clear answer to this in the way that I understand what product management is. Um, I would say that your role is to really understand what you should be building and why. Actually, your role is much more about the why you should be building something and what is the outcome the business needs and the customer needs. Um, obviously, you're there to help shepherd the execution, um, but your role is not to be a project manager. Um, so if you have to choose between uh, carefully planning your release cycle and like spending an hour with a customer, absolutely spend that hour with that customer because those are gonna be so much more rare moments of opportunity Right, like you see your engineers every day, right? See over, <laughs> over, over Zoom or Slack or whatever. Um, but yeah, so by default, be external first, be customer first, and then the execution side. There's so many people within your company that can help you drive that, and you're probably the only person that can like represent the external customers within the company. So, bias definitely towards the customer side and the market side. Yeah, definitely. Um, so jumping into the last question about the role, at least last question for now, let's see if we get more. Uh, what is the major myth or myths, myths around product management? <laughs> um, major myths. I think there was like a really popular concept around, um, about being the CEO of the product, which I think like people really enjoyed. They were like, oh my God, I can be a CEO like super early in my career. Um, and I think that ruffled a lot of feathers uh, because CEOs actually have the ability to fire people and they're like, there's a hierarchy in the relationship, right? If I'm working with my CEO, as much as we are peers at the end of the day, um, they have control over my life. Like they, they decide if I get paid. Um, and that's definitely not the case when you're a PM, you're working with your peers. Um, a lot of them will be engineers that might be more senior than you, right? The, the relationship dynamics are very different. Um, and so there, there was a little bit of a backlash when people started really being excited about being the CEO of the product where you started getting PMs that were really quite arrogant and going like, oh, but I'm in charge. Like I make all the calls and like not really being um, collaborative because they, they started being empowered by this narrative that they were the CEO of everything. 
So I think to me, that's, that's one big myth. Um, the other one kind of touches on the nature of the last question um, that uh, product managers early stage in their career, they're actually delivery managers or product owners. Um, I feel fairly strongly that that's not an effective way to bring up a product manager. Um, in fact, if, if people are interested, I, I wrote about um, a, a blog post called Minimum Viable Product Manager, which talks about the career evolution as I see it on, and how at the beginning, Yes, you're primarily driving delivery, but you need to be doing everything in, in the product management um, pyramid all the way to, to strategy, even just in, in smaller quantities. So to me, that's also a little bit of a myth, particularly if you're working in a company that's using SAFE as a flavor of, of agile, scaled up agile framework. Um, they give a lot of uh, product owner type roles that are just about delivery. And actually that's not a product manager, that's a project manager. And it's actually a really um, frustrating position to be in um, where you can't really learn the next role. And you know, there's all sorts of problems there. So those are my two uh, myths if I have to pick them. You're definitely not the CEO of the product <laughs> and um, hopefully uh, you're not uh, stuck in a position where you're a product owner um, and that you can actually get product management expertise and, and career development from the beginning. You don't need to be a project manager first. Yeah, definitely. We, and I believe that in the past and probably uh, still, uh, we, we in, in our ecosystem, we still, we still feel that, uh, especially because part of our the business, our, if you look to the majority or many of the companies that are here in Porto, the business is outside of Porto. It, we, here we have more tech hubs and or part of our ecosystem is international companies that they just have their tech hubs here. So mm -hmm. they struggle a little bit to uh, rely on product managers to drive their business and their products because the business is uh, out there and uh, the product managers here don't have easily contact with the products or the users. So yeah, sometimes it happens, but I think it's changing and uh, hopefully it's going to change more and more. Okay, jumping to the next uh, topic, strategy. Um, there is a question about, do you have any suggestion of a framework to set up the product vision? Yeah, so in an ideal world, <laughs> um, this, the, the vision for the company already exists uh, and that's been set either by a founder uh, or by a CEO or a C-level team where they say, okay, why do we exist as a company other than to make money? Like, how do we want to see a change in the world? Um, and then that's kind of cascaded through the C-level team going like, okay, if that's where we want to go, like, what are our business goals? Like, what kind of revenue do we want? Do we want to focus on a particular segment or something like that? And then you kind of translate that a little bit more about, um, so what are the kinds of problems that the product team can solve to help us achieve those goals? And it kind of just all tumbles down, uh, top down. Um, and if people are interested in this kind of um, top down uh, strategy and, and vision setting, um, I really recommend you read um, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry. I don't know if she's port <laughs> popular in Portugal, um, very popular here. Um, it's, it's an awesome book, but I diverge. So, that's the ideal scenario in my view it should be like super aligned top down if that's not a, an option at your company maybe you're too early stage and and that's not quite been uh, put together or maybe you're so large <laughs> that whatever company goals you have are really quite disconnected from where you are uh, you can go about it um, the other way around so you can go um, bottom up um, and to me when when i think about um, vision setting if you're starting from scratch, you want to be thinking about, okay, what problem am I solving for my customers today? So just start about defining what problem um, and what your product does. And then you start going like, okay, what are the other ways in which people solve the problem? Obviously that's your competition analysis and then look at the market around you. So like, are, what kind of market are we part of? Are we part of the productivity market or are we part of the biometrics market or whatever? And try to understand are there convergences happening in the market? Like analyze beyond yourself. Um, and then you start like uh, saying like, okay, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? What are my opportunities and my threats? And analyzing, okay, now that I know all about these things that are happening around me, so what? Like, what am I gonna do about it? And where am I going to travel to? And then you start laying out some themes of what you're gonna do and building out to a wider 
um, vision. And as I mentioned, this is going to be fairly uh, challenging for early stage PMs. Like your visibility of, <laughs> of what you're going to do is, is very short sighted when you're just starting out. Um, but the more you do this exercise, and particularly if you do it multiple times for your current product, maybe you do it like every six months or every year, the, the more you're going to become more familiar with zooming yourself out of like, I'm adding this button. Should it be pink or should it be blue? <laughs> like, why does this button exist? What is it trying to do? Like, what is the product trying to do? What is the company trying to do? Um, and, and that is a, a bottom up way of setting your strategy and setting your vision. I'm kind of using them a little bit interchangeably, but I do believe that unless you're uh, like deeply ingrained in the domain and you feel the pain yourself and you're kind of trying to build that 10 year future of like, self-driving cars like that's a amazing really bold um vision but if you don't have that capability that's not within you then going in a very analytical fashion might help you build out what the vision should be um and still be just as compelling definitely definitely so um i will bring now the first question from the audience the live questions uh, you mentioned that you are trying to build a three years or even more horizon for your products. Uh, are the most innovative products even planable with accuracy for a three years horizon? Mm. <laughs> um, so sometimes you can see stuff coming, right? Um, so like in, let me, let me think of a, of a good example. Maybe I can't think of one on the spot. I'm just now thinking about on Fido things. Um, but yeah, you you can see uh, stuff coming. So so okay, let let's go with the with the typical example. You you know about your 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 apples and <laughs> and your iPhones and your iPods and all that kind of stuff. We could see we could plot that computers were going to get um, more and more like smaller and smaller and smaller and more much more efficient. Right, that was a trend you could put in a strategic analysis and say hey, computers are getting really bloody fast. What does that mean? What are the opportunities that opens up for us? And um, when you start seeing iPods, right? That was before the iPhone. It's like, hey, people are carrying these like small computers on their hands, right? Like, what does that mean? What is the opportunity there? Like, there's all these trends of, of um, like, phones were not smartphones, but like phones were really portable. And so at some point you can, draw a line and, and extend it to what's imaginable. Um, it's not like one day someone wakes up and they go like, I'm gonna do this. It's like, you can read the signs of where the, um, where the industry is going to and kind of open up uh, new opportunities. I, I don't know if I can answer your question directly. Like, I, I, I would argue though that <laughs> a lot of startups are not successful within their first year. Right. And maybe it takes them three years to actually find product market fit. And you're going to get those stumbling blocks and you're going to find opportunities and execute and kind of change your mind and pivot and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's still important that you have a direction of travel. Otherwise, everybody's going in all sorts of different directions and you're basically not really going anywhere. Um, so that's why I feel like it's important to look at those kind of horizons. But I will add a little bit of nuance in that. If your company is the, the 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 direction of travel needs to be proportionate to the age of the company. So if your company is only like six months old, probably only think about the roadmap for one year. If your company has been around for 10 years, like think about the roadmap for 20 years, because that's how long you plan to stick around and you know that you're going to have the revenues. So like how far away you need to see into the future is also proportionate to how uh, confident and established and, um, and settled the company is as well. So hopefully that goes some way to, to answering your question. I think so. I think so. And that accuracy probably is going to get, or it's going to be higher when you get uh, closer to the time that you are planning. So yeah, yeah, definitely so. So let's move to the next topic, failure. Uh, you have to talk about failure mm -hmm. uh, and we already have one, que oh, one question from the live and also a question that we already had. What are your advice uh, for reducing or minimizing product fail? Um, things to minimize product failure. So number one <laughs> um, is uh, 
the longer you've done product management for, the less likely you are to make um, mistakes. So treat it as this is a journey, I'm going to get better. And like me as a PM, I'm going to evolve and I'm gonna like uh, sharpen my ability to diagnose why things are failure just by experiencing failure in the first place. Like your, your bruises are what's gonna make you really goddamn good. Um, but if we want to go like down an academic, like how do you minimize product failure? Like the, the obvious answer is like, what are your biggest risks? <laughs> can you anticipate those? Like, what are the things that you can do um, to de-risk them? Like typically um, the best way to de-risk things is to just talk to people, right? So find who are your target users or who you think your target users are and go and ask them like, what kind of problems do they have um, and and whether those problems are important. You want to be validating different things at, uh, in different phases. So to me, the first thing that you want to validate is like how valuable what you're building is. It doesn't matter if you can build it or not, and it doesn't matter if it's usable or not. Just try to figure out how valuable this thing is, like how many people have this problem, but also how often. <laughs> If I only have this problem, if a million people have this problem once in their lives, your market is really, really tiny and you're probably not going to survive. So look at frequency and also um, how really painful this is. And is it painful enough that they're going to stop doing what they're doing and change to whatever you're suggesting to do? So like those switching costs are really quite important, particularly for consumers. And, and the way that you do that is really through conversation. And there, uh, the, the key thing that you, <laughs> that you need to nail is like not leading the witness. Um, so <laughs> there's an awesome book called um, The Mum Test, like your mother. Um, when you ask your mother feedback about your product, she's always gonna lie to you because she loves you. And she's gonna see it's great, it's amazing, you're a genius. <laughs> of course, everyone's gonna buy it, right? Um, so. There, there are some really cool techniques in that book about how to interview someone without getting them to say what you want them to say. So like a really simple example is like, imagine you were developing like a new, uh, a new matcha latte or something like that. So you could say, <laughs> I could ask you, Carlos, hey, Carlos, do you like matcha latte? And you're like, oh, I guess I do. <laughs> I'm gonna be nice to you. Or I could say, how often do you have matcha lattes? And you'd go, oh, twice a week. Or I could ask, when was the last time you had a matcha latte? It's much harder to lie for this last one, right? Because it's objective. Or I could ask you, yesterday, what drink did you have? That's an objective question. And I'm not, I'm not telling you what is the right answer to make me happy, right? So finding a way to ask these questions that doesn't show the person what you hope that they will say, and if the answer is yes, <laughs> then probably you're kind of leading them somehow. Um, those kind of things really help you validate um, valuable. Uh, and then viable, obviously that's with your engineering, making sure that you can actually build it and that it will work well. And then usable is with your user researchers and making sure that you know people understand that this button does this and blah, blah, blah. But the valuable one to me is the hardest one. And the size of the market and how frequently the problem exists, those are the hardest ones. And, and that's where you as a PM should be spending uh, most of your time. Yeah, solving real and relevant products. Uh, yeah, makes all the sense. There is another question about failure, uh, not directly, but at least. What's your take about output versus outcome in product management and how it relates with the feeling of failing? I love that question. <laughs> I'm firmly on the outcome camp. <laughs> I'll get the flags and the hat <laughs> and the stickers. Um, and uh, and I see where this person is come from coming from. It definitely um, is much harder, right? It's so much harder to drive an outcome than it is to drive an output, right? To drive an output, you're going to be like, hey, I'm going to create a spreadsheet and how long is this going to take? And like, can we go faster and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly you've shipped, hooray. And then nothing happens. <laughs> and no one buys your product and you don't make any money. It doesn't matter. But you've had a beer, right? You've shipped something. Good job. Um, so it's much easier to celebrate um, output than it is uh, to actually do outcomes. So very much on the outcome side, particularly when it comes to, to customer outcomes and, and business outcomes. Um, 
where that relates to failure is that you're much more likely to fail, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, because it is significantly harder. Um, but there, the way to kind of topple it on its head is to switch away from, okay, we didn't achieve the outcome, but like, did you learn something along the way about was this valuable? Uh, maybe it fell down down the viability or the usability. Typically, it falls down down the valuable side. Um, but essentially, like, treating that progress towards the outcome as already a win. And then the other one is celebrate, creating a, a, a culture of celebrating outcomes and creating a culture of celebrating de-risking and creating a culture where people feel safe to say in front of the C-level staff, hey, we tried this, we tried this, we tried this. None of this worked. We don't think we should be investing any more money into this. Like, let me save you millions of dollars. <laughs> And let's move on, right? And the C-level staff saying, great, thank you. You've saved us a lot of hassle. We're going to reinvest this into something that's much more likely to succeed. And, and feeling that that's a job well done, like that's a mentality shift. That's really important. Like to me, like disassociating yourself from the product is really important. <laughs> I talk Definitely. a lot about that in, in, my, in my talk. It's, it's like one of the hardest things is you go, I'm not, your, I'm not my product. Like my product might have died and maybe that was a good thing, but I'm still here and I've learned so much more. And like my self-worth is not the same thing as my product self-worth. Like that's a cre critical concept because then the way that you think about yourself like really affects how motivated you are, how much risk you're going to take. So that separation of like the product's doing shit, but I'm all right. Like that's a critical thing to nail as early as often, um, as early as possible in your career. Definitely. So I'll, I'll pick one now from uh, the chats uh, from Pedro regarding B2B. And uh, let's try to figure out if you can leverage your knowledge about B2B. So B2B products are difficult because companies don't sell to that many customers. So pivoting based on customer feedback is harder. What are your thoughts on this? Because they don't sell to that many customers. Is, is that their, yeah. their pre question? That's I, interesting. Think so. I think it's a matter of uh, the frequency that we get feedback is not not higher and probably it's harder to get feedback from from the b2b side hmm. so i've i've uh, full disclosure i've i've worked only in b2b companies um so it sounds like this person is in a b2b company but fairly early stage so maybe they only have like one or two or maybe three uh key customers um and to me, the key to, to B2B is like really partnering with your sales colleagues and really partnering with your account managers to get access to your customers. And then the other one is like typically the buyers and the end users are not the same. And so really understanding what are the buying factors and what are the usability factors that make a success of the buy in the end are really critical. And because you don't have access to the people, you need to partner with your growth colleagues to introduce you and build trust with them. So the thing about um, having few customers and them kind of taking you into different markets, um, sometimes that's really necessary, right? If you don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from and you're running out of runway, maybe where your customer is pulling you is a bigger market than your market is currently. And that's sort of an important thing. Like, I think as PMs, we always have this like allergic reaction to like, oh, a customer asked for it. It's a special, we don't wanna do it. We just wanna build whatever we think is the right thing. And um, we need to be really careful not to be arrogant and not to be the CEO of the product. Maybe the customer is asking for something that is actually like huge and that loads and loads of other customers would have. You just don't know those customers yet. Um, so being really careful with listening with an open mind and not just disregard, oh, they're asking for that they don't know what they need. Um, and not implement exactly what they're saying, but get to like, what problem do they actually have? They're like, please add this button, it will save my life. And you're like, okay, what are you actually trying to do? Like, what impact would that have? How do you solve that problem today? How many hours are you spending on this? And using the mum test, right, to, to, to get like quantification um, and get like a real answer so that they're not lying to you without meaning to. Um, and then, okay, great. So we've understood the problem. What can we find out? Even if we don't have customers that have that problem, can we find out if that's a big problem in the industry? And like that kind of stuff, you're, you're probably going to look at 
are there other companies that are solving this problem today? Do I, can, are there any signals or, or analysis that I can do from my computer? Or do I need to like randomly reach out to people on LinkedIn and go like, hey, this is, <laughs> I'm, doing a, I'm doing a study on this. Um, or you can even hire some user research firm to, to do that for you. Um, but yeah, so I think the question is, is a little bit more about B2B in early stage and hopefully Pedro, you, you agree. Um, and, and to me is like, when you're early stage, like listening to your early stage adopters is really critical and, and don't be snobbish about it. And like do validate whether what they're asking for is, is a much bigger opportunity than what you consider your, your core right now. Cause it might just be it. Otherwise, you know, um, you might just need the money and, and occasionally that's the right thing to do. Otherwise the company goes under and everybody's fired, but <laughs> long-term, um, long-term those decisions are, are going to be important. Definitely. And I think this, this tip about collaborating with your sales and customer success team is, is vital. Uh, my previous experience, I had that, I had that experience that my users and my customers were German. So even, the, even if I had contact with them, it would be really hard for me to understand them. So I need to totally uh, collaborate with sales, but at the same time, we need to be really careful to avoid bias and, uh, from them and what they think about what should be the solution uh, and how to solve a certain problem. So totally, it's a hard balance to manage. So let's jump to the next question regarding discovery. How do you deal with product discovery process? Do you have any tip to the audience regarding product discovery? Yeah, I think we touched on that um, earlier. So, so to me, uh, discovery is, is primarily about um, validating um, the, how valuable the problem is that you're trying to solve. Um, so typically, I kind of think of it in, in two ways. There's like your inbound, <laughs> inbound product management, like people come to you with feature requests and all that kind of stuff. And then there's your outbound where you go, okay, well, I'm, I'm in this market and I think there's a big opportunity in this other market. And I think I can bridge from one to the other. And now I'm going to go outbound to try and find out if that's true. So let me make that a little bit more concrete. Um, so you could think about the time where uh, someone at Uber was like, hey, we've got all these drivers. This is a really big asset. Um, what if we try to bridge into the food delivery market, right? Like, is that a good idea or not? So then what they probably had to do is like, go and discover, like, how big is the food delivery market? Like, go and interview some restaurateurs. Like, um, uh, how do you deliver food today? What are the biggest problems there? Like, what are, what are you frustrated by? What do you think would be a better way of doing it? Da, 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 da. So like, um, to me, the, the discovery, you need to find a way to balance it out with like reactive and, and proactive. And that's why the strategy process I was talking about earlier is really, really important um, so that you can, you can drive the conversation yourself rather than always someone coming to you and you're always on the defensive of like, but why don't you have this? And <laughs> your competitors have this and, and, and all that kind of discussion that's uh, a little bit more sales driven. Um, but what else can I tell you about uh, discovery processes? I think there, uh, hopefully you're in a company where you have uh, user researchers and if you don't, uh, maybe your UX designers um, can, can help you with that. So partnering, really strongly with those individuals is, is really critical because they will bring a different lens and they'll be able to help you prototype what you're, what you're uh, talking about, right? So um, just talking about an idea can help, but like actually showing a drawing, even if it's just like on a post-it uh, often helps people um, understand whether this is gonna be helpful to them. Um, the other thing is depending on where on the spectrum uh, your engineers are, and, and I don't mean <laughs> the spectrum of, uh, of, 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 of disabilities or anything like that. I meant like on the spectrum of, of, are they really, really technical or are they more business facing? Some engineers are incredibly passionate about the problem that you're trying to solve. And some engineers are incredibly passionate about the architecture and the trade-offs and like, is it gonna scale to a million, all that kind of stuff. And some people are in between. And so these people that are on this side of like being really customer focused, bring them with you to your discovery. Cause they're gonna be the people that go like, ah, oh, if they're trying to do this, like there's this new technology and databases or whatever, that's gonna solve that really well. And as long as, even if you're technical or not technical, like these people will be able to do 
uh, linkages that you're personally not going to be able to do. And that gives you a huge uh, advantage, right? Because that's where you get innovation is like a new problem with new technology. And suddenly that's like a, a brand new thing that no one's really thought of doing before. So yeah, keep it collaborative and do as much as it as possible and try to balance out inbound with outbound and more strategic driven discovery. I think those are my three key takeaways. Definitely, definitely, yes. Uh, to bring them, we need to be focused on outcome. And if we are focused on outcome, it's much easier to, to bring them on board in order to, to help us on, in this discovery phase. Um, so jumping to the product initial, initial launch phase, can you provide key insights based on your experience on the best approach, methods, or techniques to validate on early stage product ideas in the forms of prototypes of any other sort of MVPs? I think that's very much the, the question that we've just done. Um, yeah, nice, I, think, um, I don't know if I, I have much more to add to, to, um, to what we've just described. So the, I, I will touch on the fact that um, being able to scope out a, a really tight um, minimum viable product is, is a core skill. But I would also challenge um, us all, including myself, you know, this is a hard thing to do, um, to distinguishing between building to learn and building to earn. <laughs> and this is a, 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 a Melissa Perry quote. So she talks a lot about, you can build things that just help you get data or get, help you validate whether something is, is valuable. And those things typically will go in the bin uh, as soon as you've got that hypothesis validated. Uh, but you can build things that are for earning cash, right? <laughs> and those are your products that are going to stick around. Um, so do balance that out in your discovery and, and validation uh, phase. So one example that, that she gives is like um, building a little pop-up as, as someone is abandoning your flow to say, hey, what was missing? That's not part of the product. That's like building to learn. Um, so you can figure out, hey, I'm trying to improve conversion on this page given the feedback that I've received, actually, this is the biggest problem. That's very valuable in, in a B2C kind of environments. I think that's my main tip in addition to what we just mentioned. Um, yeah, I yeah. totally agree. I think experimentation, it's a really important step uh, after discovery or during discovery, uh, or even sometimes can be part of the discovery phase and launching to, to get data to, to have a better understanding. Um, yeah, it's really important. And today with A-B testing and all these uh, techniques and tools that we have, it's much easier to, to learn from what we launch and what we experiment. Great. Um, so we have one specific question regarding estimations. How do you deal with the uncertainty, uncertainty of estimations? Would you rather make a heavier investment upfront to understand better a delivery date, or do you prefer to plan delivery as you go, but then you don't have a good date to give to the stakeholders? Yeah, <laughs> sounds like a stressful. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a stressful question. Um, so, my ideal world and uh, maybe this is fairyland, uh, is that you don't need to have deadlines and uh, that you're just working towards outcomes um, and that you have goals that are outcome driven. Um, and essentially you promise to the business to spend their money as well as possible to achieve those outcomes for a quarter. And you promise to come back and say what you've done and whether that worked or didn't work or report back um, what were the learnings and what you're gonna do about it and how you're gonna change your targets or keep them the same or, or make them more ambitious. So that's to me like the nirvana. And depending on the maturity of your product, you can actually operate like that. Um, so it might be that really, really early stage you're chasing much more revenue because the company um, being alive is at stake. But when you get to a certain steady state, transitioning to, to outcomes is probably sustainable. And we have worked like that at Onfido. But I will go back to answer um, your question specifically. So my view is that estimations are limited in value and that you're going to spend a lot of time trying to estimate something that is, is basically not really going to help you so much, right? So we used to do uh, estimates on a story base. So we used to follow um, 
uh, Scrum, a, a, a flavor of Agile. We've now transitioned to Kanban because in part we realized that there was, <laughs> there was very little value in us spending time trying to assign a number point and an estimation to each one of the stories. And so now we've moved up. And so we, we do a higher level planning where we look at the epic and we say, okay, this epic will drive this outcome. And we think that it will take whatever, how much time, but we're not looking at like at the week level or at the day level or at the story level, we're looking at, is it, is it in the order of magnitude of X, right? You're, you're zooming out, you're adding much more boundaries and that helps you give a vague understanding to the business of like, these are the things that I think I will do within the next quarter. So if you can switch to the day and the hour to hopefully the month and eventually to the quarter, you're gonna build a whole lot more capacity where you say a much more vague deadline that will allow you to one, have a lot more freedom to experiment and um, have more freedom to fail, right? It might not work right at the beginning. Um, and delivery dates are only helpful for things that are extremely well known. Like, you know what the problem is, you know exactly what the solution is. And that's like, yay, celebrate it's live. But those are so rare. Like most of the time we're just trying to figure out what we should be building and obsessing about the deadline is like not the most helpful way to build um, products. But I do understand that in particularly in B2B scenarios, sometimes there's a customer and they need it by a certain time. Uh, otherwise the deal falls through. So really try to try to make that the exception rather than the rule and build that relationship with your with your sales and growth colleagues to say, if we operate on deadlines, the, the company will like stall. We will stop being innovative. We will not make the huge leaps in performance that we need. And we're just gonna build shit on top of stuff. <laughs> um, so like, let's transition to an outcome model and on exception, for very, very strategic deals that help us grab, I don't know, a new market or whatever, we will, uh, but we will only do it uh, for a quarter type uh, time frame. Like it should be very normal for you to say, I'm gonna try to do X within the next quarter, but it might not work, right? Like building that relationship where people are comfortable with that is 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 hard, but it is really critical for, for product success, at least I've found so far. And for, for B2B, and this is a question uh, from me, uh, for B2B, don't you think that estimations sometimes, especially the L-level ones, first to start having the first discussions with the team to discuss how we are going to build and the viability and also to take decisions. If you have multiple options of things that you probably already estimated on your side, the product, the value that is going to have for your users and customers. But on the other end, you don't have any clue about what is going to be the cost and how it's going to be the effort. Don't you think that an estimation sometimes is helpful on that? Not to manage expectations, but at least to help you to decide what is the next move or the next yeah, step. It, it's helpful to understand time to market, um, but you could also take an approach. Uh, so, so absolutely, and I agree with you, but I'm just gonna like extend that to the extreme. Um, so, um, I think his name is Des. Yeah, Des from Intercom. I don't know if you're familiar with the company. They've got a really strong uh, product culture. So Des from Intercom argues that you shouldn't care about how expensive something is to build. You should just be building the most expensive stuff. Um, not expensive, uh, valuable stuff. Sorry, <laughs> there I got that completely wrong. You should just spend your time building the most impactful stuff, regardless of, of how expensive it is. His view is that too often we are um, willing to bring up in priority things that have a small impact just because they're also small to build. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah we'll, we'll slot it in. And if you do that five times, <laughs> suddenly you've just lost the opportunity, the opportunity cost, right? You, you lost the opportunity to build a single thing that would have cost as much as all of those and would have had like 10 times the impact of all those small things. Um, so yes, it's, it's helpful, but also don't get too obsessed with, hey, we're gonna ship another small thing and then you just do small things and you don't really move uh, forward on the hard and, and really impactful stuff. So his view is like, you've got this of like, impact and, and expensiveness. And he's like, you should spend all of your time here. Like stop trying to <laughs> tap all these small wins, screw the small wins, right? You're not gonna get anywhere with loads of small wins. <laughs> yeah. 
definitely it fits really well in a certain quarter. So let's do the small stuff to fit it really well. Yeah, sometimes it happens. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, but it's a fallacy, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So let's go to, I think, one of the last questions. How do you make product decisions at Ofido uh, regarding qualitative versus quantitative um, data, I believe? Yeah. Well, we try to have both. <laughs> Um, so you, you, how do I answer that question? You need both. <laughs> we, 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 we have a user research team, um, that does a lot of the qualitative analysis. So like, um, how easy is this to use? Like, do people understand what they're supposed to do? Like a lot of the usability studies, um, they also do a lot of the, the, valuable studies with the PMs a lot of the time. And all of that is qualitative. Um, yeah, and, and then the quantitative stuff is, a lot of it is metrics that are internal. Um, so like, what is the, I mean, to use our terms is like false acceptance, false rejection, like how likely are we to, to pass a fraud? How likely is it that someone is gonna uh, correctly be verified? How many errors are we making? Like all of these things um, are very numbers focused. Like. Just as an anecdote, we are so numbers obsessed that every week when we do our stand up with the whole company, we have a chart of the week, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and we celebrate when charts go up and it might just be like a random piece of product. So um, we do a lot more celebration of outcomes through our, our chart of the week than we do with, hey, we shipped blah. Like shipping blah is irrelevant. It's only when the chart goes up that, that we actually uh, shout about it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I think you always need both, um, and you're you're if you're going only with numbers, you don't really understand the story behind it, and it's quite risky. But if you just go with stories, you don't know how big the problem is, and you can't really quantify it. So that's quite risky. So you probably need both to like blend that out and even out the risks as much as possible. We're in the yeah. risk management business sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I think we, there is there is a concept of product sense, and of course that partners really well with experience uh, and part of, yeah, quant uh, we need to use quantitative, we need to use qualitative, but also in the end, we will need to also have your experience and what you think that is important for your user based on both uh, to take decisions. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. So we have a really big question from Andrea that this starts with uh, 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 not the question itself. So small wings go very much in line with the MVP. And the MVP concept is started to be redefined as to oppose the idea of viability with the cheapest ploy. You have other concepts such as MMP or MLP, which should uh, and can be applicable to product development, depending on the scenario. Now goes the question. Uh, Susanna, how do you see other product disciplines such as product ops or product marketing working in collaboration with product managers? Okay, I'm going to need uh, Andrea to help me with MMP and MLP because I know minimum delightful uh, product and I know like minimum viable product. I don't know about the MMP and the MLP. Maybe someone else in the in the group can, can add that to the chat. So those are concepts that are new to me. So thank you, Andrea, for sharing. I'll, I'll certainly be reading about those. Um, and how do I see product ops and, and product marketing working in collaboration with product managers? That That's something I can definitely answer. So um, product marketing at Onfido is primarily um, doing two things. One is sales enablement because we are a B2B uh, company. So how, how on, we as PMs position the product and then how do we get that message uh, packaged up in a way that's really e easy for, for our uh, PMs, to, um, for our growth uh, folk to, to use. And then the other one is gathering market data and helping us do market sizing and market analysis to help us with the more strategic uh, analysis. Um, so some of the tasks that product marketeers do are like they do a lot of win loss analysis and they will feed that back to us and they will collate all of that and, and tell us what kind of trends they've been seeing or maybe they will analyze um, the types of industries that we're selling to and win rates and things like that. 
Uh, when it comes to product operations, so we do have product operations on Fido. Um, a lot of it is around um, being a lightweight data analyst uh, where they can diagnose operational issues. So particularly in our business, it's something like, oh, I don't know, uh, someone has started seeing a bunch of fraud with Belgium national identity documents, <laughs> which I know is like super foreign to everyone else on this call. And then we need to go and diagnose what the hell happened because we were a very operation uh, crucial product, right? Like, the conversion has changed, what the hell happened? Um, or like there's a spike in fraud, what the hell happened? So in I don't feed product ops is a lot of what the hell happened <laughs> as a role. Um, and so they diagnose and then they make recommendations um, so that we can improve. Um, and that's primarily how we work with product operations. I haven't worked elsewhere that includes product operations. Um, so uh, I would love Andrea, if you're able to share um, oh yeah, minimum lovable uh, product, lovely. Um, if you're able to to share uh, more about uh, the product ops um, roles that you've seen elsewhere, I, I think that's a relatively new uh, function. And if there's any links that you recommend uh, myself and the group um, read, I think would be uh, super valuable. Yeah, so the minimum lovable product, I, I have seen that before and it's um, much more about thinking about all the needs as opposed to just the functional uh, level of, of what outcomes you can get. And uh, to me, <laughs> I, I err more on the make the first release lovable. Um, and MVP as it is defined often is the building to learn rather than the building to earn. And being really clear about why you're building and what the outcome is that you're trying to drive, I think will help you define what the scope should be. The minimum lovable product is probably your first building to earn and the minimum viable product is probably, if not one of the first, but like maybe one of the last building to learn type thing that maybe might still go in the bin. But you know, there, there's a spectrum of how people define it. Um, regardless of the, of the definition, I think just the earn and learn, I think will help you understand how you should be um, scoping it. Definitely. So we are we are uh, getting closer to the end. I will go to the last question uh, regarding uh, Rafael is asking uh, still on the product decision process. Who uh, is responsible to take the decision, or what is your way to take this decision? What is the decision process? Decisions in general, like <laughs> mainly <at> product decisions. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Uh, I don't feel specifically the product decisions are normally the call of the product manager. Um, so there, there is, um, unless it's like a platform level uh, impact, um, we, we're very keen on, on having um, like the, the product managers empowered to make those kind of decisions. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a collaborative process with does your, like how does your engineering lead feel about it? How does your machine lead, uh, machine learning leads feel about it? How does your UX researcher feel about it? You collaborate and then at the end of the day, the PM is the one making the call, uh, but occasionally you do need to escalate beyond uh, your level, but those should be really rare. We, we function based on empowered teams and that means at the end of the day that the PM makes the call. Great. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, I think we, we don't have any other question. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, and I will now hand over to Daniela to close the session. Thank you so much, Susanna. Thank you, Carlos. So we have a lot to chew right now, don't we? <laughs> so we had um, a lot of questions from, from the audience. Thank you all so much for, for being here and for engaging so much. Um, I think that this is a winning format, so maybe we'll, we will do uh, some more sessions like, like this one. Um, after uh, this session ends, you will be receiving an email from us to ask for your feedback so we can keep improving uh, these, these sessions and think of future topics to be addressed. Um, this session is being recorded, so it will be available. Um, it will be published online on Scala Porto's YouTube and also on the social networks. So uh, keep following to, to see uh, everything. Don't forget to attend the product management nights uh, 
in Porto, the events that are coming. And follow Susanna on Twitter. Her, her handle is Susanna Villops. So you can keep uh, chatting with her uh, on Twitter and uh, following her insights uh, on product management. Thank you all for being here and uh, let's keep developing awesome products. See you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah, for us, you as well.